Whether you're used to cruising cats or coming to them for the first time, the bottom line is that they're very different to monohulls. But how? Why does it matter? We've come to Tortola in the British Virgin Islands, one of the centres for catamaran cruising, where we've been lent a Moorings 4800 and we're joined by renowned multi-hull designer Nigel Ahrens. The emergency escape hatch. How would you cope if the worst was to happen? And what about the topic of man overboard? How might that differ on board a cat from a monohull? In this program, I talked to Nigel Ahrens about some of those issues. Should the worst happen, um, God forbid, but should the worst happen and we're faced with a man overboard situation, how would the recovery process differ on a multi-hull than a monohull? Well, I think fundamentally it would be a big mistake to come in upwind of a victim. Normally it would be nice to drift down onto them uh, so that they can't uh, lose contact with you. But I think the, wind, the windage and the tendency to move sideways rapidly uh, together with the fact that the propellers are not far away, they're only just you know a couple of feet under the surface. I can see that very quickly, even if you weren't being pushed underwater by the boat, your legs would be perhaps getting into danger. So fundamentally, I think we have to change that around and say that the victim should be on the windward side of the boat. You should come in perhaps uh, downwind from them, perhaps turning a little bit upwind, but nevertheless, no question of drifting down onto mm. the victim. To get back to the person, I wouldn't try sailing unless you don't have an engine for some reason. I'd, I'd furl up the headsail um, and motor back and I'd come up gently to the person, possibly with someone ready with a harness and a, and a chair to go down and uh, rescue them. Or if you have something like a life sling. Uh, to, to winch the person back on board or, or depending on the configuration of the boat perhaps pick them up from the transom but in, in rescuing them most important thing is not to injure them further by hitting them with the hull or, or getting them involved in the propeller. In the very unlikely event of a capsize what would you do on a big boat like this? Well I think the, the most important thing and there, is, there are initiatives in this direction now is to try to get a better understanding boat by boat of how they will sit upside down. If it was a dinghy, we'd try it, wouldn't we? We'd say, there it is, upside down, and get practice to sorting it out. Can't do that with a big boat. Um, so uh, there are ways of evaluating through calculation exactly where it would float, or pretty much exactly. They're actually much more complicated than might, you might think. And they're all based on the use of a virtual model, obviously, but uh, there are many, many components and they all have to be mixed into the equation. And uh, there are initiatives to, to make progress in that direction. I think it's fundamental before you consider what you're going to do in the very unlikely event of capsize, but the first thing is you absolutely have to know what level the boat's going to float. So that's the first thing, and that's up to us technicians, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never capsized a big catamaran, or even a small one for that matter. But the closest I got was on the PlayStation, which is a 105-foot catamaran. We were doing the transatlantic record, and we got hit by a sudden secondary cold front off uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And out of that completely clear sky in the middle of the night, the wind went from 35 knots to 60 knots. And... Uh, the helmsman, who is also the designer of the boat, Gina Morelli, did a great job, bore away to very, very deep, to 180 true, but still with the wind in the sail, which was uh, two reefs and the jib, the boat just started nosediving with the pressure of, of uh, 60 knots of cold December air. And the boat went up to 45 degrees, the rudders were 20 feet out of the water. And that is definitely the closest, closest I've come to capsizing a big catamaran. The first thing, if, if you were briefing a crew, a safety briefing, you would say, in the, if this unlikely event happens, get in the cabin 
uh, uh, sorry, into the hull, not not into the saloon. If you're in the saloon, dive down into the uh, hulls. That's the safest place to be. Well, why is that the safest place? Well, if you imagine, if it floated upside down in such a way that the sole was almost on the water, that would be highly dangerous. It could actually hold you down, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to see your way out of it, particularly if it was light. Uh, so, uh, but in the hull, there's definitely, definitely going to be lots of air. Uh, the boat is watertight when it's the right way up, so the wrong way up, it's airtight, and, and the air will not go out of it. And uh, so, the first thing is, to, to, if you're inside, is to get into the hulls. Mm -hmm. The worst thing is a sudden increase in wind, perhaps from a cold front or a tropical squall. So you have to be very aware of the weather and be prepared to reduce sail early when you see a squall coming. Um, so you're prepared for it even if it is not that strong. Um, so I think watching the weather, really understanding what's happening with the weather, whether it's, whether it's steady breezes or whether it's squally, it affects how you, you sail day and night. And so at night, when you can't see the squalls coming, you may not have uh, a radar, um, but you know it's going to be squally, then, then, then reef down. We're not, we're not racing across uh, the Atlantic or on a passage. Um, the main thing is to get there safely. But the more information you have on the weather, the easier it is to decide on your sail plan. Um, and you need to decide the sail plan for the uh, strongest winds you're likely to experience in, in that, that sort of watch period that you've, you have. Now there are hatches, emergency escape hatches on the inside of the hulls. If the boat is upside down, should you try and open those uh, to get the air in or well, should you? There again you need to be, uh, to have to anticipate whether you can do that or not. Um, and that comes through this process of calculation. Um, if you, my, my, I think my first advice was don't, would be don't open it up straight away. Um, if air rushes in, the boat will definitely, uh, or rushes sort of out of the hull and is replaced by water, obviously the boat will float lower. So I would think of it as being a, a kind of watertight unit, and if you stay in there, you're going to be all right, certainly for the foreseeable future. You know. and if you've done everything to prevent the capsize, but it was inevitable, then my tendency, if I was in the cockpit, would be to dive down below. Because I think you're going to be safer down below as the boat's turning over than on deck, potentially trapped under the, under the deck uh, or the trampoline. So uh, you'd end up upside down standing on the roof of the coach roof. And there should be, depending on the design of the boat, but you would want to check it, there should be enough um, flotation in the coach roof to keep keep you above um, your head above water or you're going to have to climb back in climb up into the hulls to get out of the water but generally I'd say you're safer inside the boat than out. Yeah, it would be very ironical to find you were, you were on, on the inside of guardrails that are designed just for your safety and that you can't get out through mm. them. So, so get clear get of the boat clear, yes. but not so clear that you can't then get back to it when no, it's, it's not, down. No, it's not going to blow away. I mean, it's going to be very heavily in the water and uh, you, you can swim back to it if you need to.